Welcome, everybody, to our Friday, November the 19th edition of Chestnut Chat. I'm Sarah Fitzsimmons. I'm the Director of Restoration for the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, restoration. So that's what I love to do every day is think about restoration of the American chestnut. Today we've got an amazing panel. We've got four folks with us today, Chris Matson, Chaz Oliver, Zach Prusak, and uh, Walt Thompson. Uh, they're going to talk to us about what they learned about restoring a pine, a longleaf pine savanna ecosystem. And even though these are very different species, longleaf pine is incredibly different from American chestnut and the longleaf pine savanna ecosystem is vastly different than uh, the primary ecosystem that American chestnut grows in. There's going to be some uh, processes of restoration of these two uh, projects that we'll be able to apply to American chestnut. So that's why we've invited these folks here today um, to give us some ideas that we can maybe use as we look to put American chestnut back into the forest, primarily the mountains of, of the Eastern US. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us. We've got about a hundred folks on here uh, this morning. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so this is a webinar format. If you haven't joined us before, this is a webinar format. The only people who can be seen and talk are the seven people here on your screen right now. Uh, Lisa, myself, uh, Chris, Walt, Zach, Chaz, and Tom. Uh, Tom is playing the role of Kendra today. Those of you who are used to getting your responses by Kendra will now be responded to uh, by Tom. So Tom's gonna be monitoring the Q&A and helping us type um, answers to questions. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A module. At the bottom of the Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A. Please put your questions there. It's just a lot easier for me to keep track of them in Q&A. If you have witty banter or snide or snarky comments, put those over in the chat. That's where those belong. Um, and we'll keep track of those as well. Um, generally, I keep, um, uh, uh, I keep the questions until the end. Um, I will monitor them. If there's a, a question that you have that re we really need um, a good clarification, I'll interrupt our presenters, but usually I try not to do that. I try to keep them all until the end, uh, but feel free to type your question in. Whenever it comes into your head, uh, throw that into the Q&A module. Um, but like I said, this is a webinar format. We can't hear you, we can't see you. So go ahead and do whatever it is you do during the day. Enjoy your lunch if this is your lunchtime. Um, and uh, we will enjoy um, uh, the presenters today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Lisa Thompson and uh, she'll introduce our uh, chat today and our first presenter who, whom she knows very well. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, this is a really special one to me and the, the genesis of it really happened right here in our kitchen where I'm sitting. Um, and by the way, I'm the president and CEO of the American Chestnut Foundation, have been so for the last seven years. But prior to that, I worked at the Nature Conservancy for 28 years and went from uh, a receptionist to a land manager to a philanthropy officer and all, all kinds of things in between. And I was lucky enough that I got to work with uh, Chris, Zach, and Walt, um, and during that time, and just watched their innovation and their incredible, um, uh, you know, drive to to figure things out that had never been done before. So um, the genesis happened because Sarah comes down here sometimes and stays with us when she has business uh, for the Chestnut Foundation in Asheville. And she and Walt hardly are quiet when they're here. They just talk restoration um, until I'm about blue in the face and I go do something else. Um, but no, they're great. And, and Walt is um, not only a former colleague, but my husband of 41 years on Monday. Do you remember that, Walt? It's our anniversary on Monday. <laughs> God, you reminded me. So anyway, this is a special one. And Zach, is a very dear friend and was just up here visiting with his wife, Jamie. So um, this one's near and dear to my heart. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Walt who will share his screen and do a brief introduction on his background. And you guys, if you would all just kind of tell you, tell the folks who you are and what you do, that would be helpful. So I won't botch your introductions myself. Take it away, Wally. Okay, let's see if I can do this. I'm an analog guy in a digital world. I think they wrote a song about that. Okay, is it working? From beginning. There we go. Everybody sees the screen well? Looking good. Yep. Okay. 
My name is Walt, the retired guy. I had a 40 year uh, career in conservation in Florida, mainly managing uh, pine savanna landscapes from the higher versions of it, the uh, Sandhill Turkey Oak systems, all the way down to the uh, very wet uh, pine savannas in the Northern Everglades to Southern Orlando. And what I wanna do today uh, and what generated this is talk about using the Disney Wilderness Preserve in Central Florida as an example, large scale restoration and what it takes to take restoration of an ecosystem or ecosystems involving a, a keystone tree like chestnut all the way to a large scale habitat restoration. So let, let's move forward. So this is gonna be a cursory review of aspects of ecosystem uh, restoration at scale, again, using Disney Wilderness Preserve. And the intent is to generate lots of questions and how you would think about restoring chestnut ecosystems because chestnut existed in several forest types and ecosystems. Again, using DWP, Disney Wilderness Preserve, I'll say DWP a lot, it's a 12,000 acre, 20 year mitigation funded project. As you can see, the landscape is a very large upland and wetland matrix of uh, grassy and some forested ecosystems, all basic, basically very tightly interconnected. And the habitats are pine savanna, oak scrub, wet grasslands, forested wetlands. It's important to ask when you start such a project at this scale, do you really understand the ecosystem and its components, all the elements, process requirements? This was a fire and water, big process restoration. And, and with all those parts, you had, and when you start the project, you have to always be a pre uh, prepared to adapt and adapt quickly. So let's talk about the location of the site. In the, uh, this, uh, pick, you see the uh, Kissimmee Restoration uh, Basin, the Kissimmee River Basin. The project is in South Central Florida, Florida Peninsula, and it is pretty much central in the upper Kissimmee chain of lakes, which is the headwaters for the Kissimmee River, which flows south to the Everglades and Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee. Okay. Let me go down. So this is the boundary of the Disney Wilderness Preserve. Again, 12,000 acres, 19 square miles. Um, the colored areas within the landscape represent all the regulatory wetlands uh, that had to be restored through the 20 years of the project. Um, all these wetlands were interconnected with ditches, uh, small ditches, to medium-sized ditches, 30 feet wide and total footprint, maybe three to six feet deep, to very large ditches that you could probably drive a medium-sized bulldozer in the bottom of the ditch, drive by it and not see the roof of the equipment. Very big ditches. And uh, the landscape was, at the time of acquisition, was altered vegetation from drained hydrology and uh, the fire cycle was out of whack. It was burned pretty much in the winter season, not the growing season. And the fire frequency, the repetitive period of fire events was too, too few relative to natural frequencies. And the site was heavily logged. It was stumped and, and very overgrazed. Uh, so that was the starting picture. There were three phases of wetland restoration and the phases were based on was the wetland kind of the, would restoration impact outside the owned landscape, the 12,000 acres. And then the phase three were those wetland uh, restoration projects that would actually impact outside landowners or were involved with the, the uh, restoration schedule for the Kissimmee chain of lakes. The upland restoration strategies were of three types, 
three strategies. Uh, process restoration was, I say simply, but it wasn't simple, restoring the hydrology of the site and restoring fire. The second type of strategy was, okay, the system is so out of whack that just restoring fire and water isn't gonna fix it. You have to use mechanical equipment to augment the vegetation structure, grinding, shredding, timber removal. And then the full Monty sites like the pastures, these are heavily pasteurized area, almost pure behavior grass. It was soup to nuts restoration. And that, that is Chris's expertise. And he solved that problem for us. So I'm not gonna go into it. So how successful was this project over 20 years? Uh, we restored, protected, protected, restored, and enhanced six, almost 17,000 acres of wetlands. Uh, we basically uh, lifted or created 230 acres of new wetlands. And the project was finished ahead of schedule in about 18 years. And uh, the project, was not all done at once, of course. There were numerous, numerous restoration uh, site level projects uh, phased out through that 20 years, both upland and wetland. And there were about, there were over 40 on site projects that were done through that time scale. So, what does it take to do large scale re restoration when you're repairing ditches and when you're doing? Uh, bringing back process. It takes big equipment. It takes the same kind of equipment that created uh, the problem that you're fixing. We used shredders, choppers. Uh, actually, we used tree grinders, and the one we used was twice this size. Um, and we actually used logging and timber removal as a strat strategy, primarily to get uh, offsite pine out of wetlands. So let's talk about the ditch restoration. This is an example of a medium-sized ditch as it looked uh, pre-restoration. And these oaks are growing on the spoil berms of the ditch excavation. And the oaks are about 70 to 90 years old. Uh, and they are native live oaks, beautiful native live oaks. So how did we do it? Well, we used a tree grinder and we ground away all the oaks and the vegetation that was on top of the spoil berms. Then we used the track hoe and we scooped out all the wetland vegetation and put that aside with the stored wood chips. We used uh, bulldozers, medium and large, uh, to push in the spoil berms back into the ditch. And then we also used the track hoe because track hoes are beautiful instruments and they can do really fine work. And then we took all the vegetation and the debris and we smeared it all over the top. And so hydrology restored. Ask me what about the turkeys later? Okay, so restoration at scale. Restoration, no, this is not Eric Von Donegan photographs of uh, alien landing patches. This is, uh, several of the ditches that were restored on this 12,000 acre site. There were over 15 miles of ditches. This is one of the big, uh, big ones. This, uh, these were probably, some of these were 15 feet deep through uplands, connecting wetland coming toward us to another wetland to drain all the water off this landscape toward Lake Hatchenhaw and the perimeter creeks, one of them being Reedy Creek. Notice, I wanna talk about adaptation. These patches you see, one in the distance that have silt vents and hay were engineered plugs. That was the original theory of how we would fix these. And we learned pretty quick that just only plugging ditchways doesn't work. We had a flood event, 12 inch over two days event. What do you think happened to these plugs? Water wants to seek the pathway. And if there's a way for it to conduit, it will find an edge and then cut through it and doesn't work. So we went to whole ditch filling. And these circles are little, this, this was invented by the track operator, shallow lensatic ponds to make up for the missing fill. So what does it take in, in, uh, to manage a project of this size over 20 years? Lots and lots of planning. Planning is essential. And of course, permitting. 
there were six regulatory agencies in this re uh, restoration for almost every project we did. And the six actually is the Florida Division of Forestry because fire is regulated in Florida. So these plans include detailed construction plans, work timelines, benchmarks, contingency planning for weather events, tropical storms, you're repairing ditches and tropical storms, equipment break, breakages, uh, safety plans. This is, some of this equipment can accidentally grind a human being up in a second uh, or crush them. So things happen, you gotta have good safety plans. Monitoring schedules, monitoring procedures, I believe there was over 35 miles of transect lines across these wetlands to monitor the success of vegetation change. And permit reporting to the agencies was regular and it, it was uh, an, an intense amount of time to uh, keep up with the regula regulation. Believe it or not, if you restore a wetland, it's regulated. If you, a ditch, that is created historically, if it's got wetland vegetation in the bottom, is regulated. It's a altered wetland, but it's still a wetland. So, okay, so what does it really take to do restoration at scale? Ecosystem restoration in the United States is a $25 billion industry. Um, Disney Wilderness Preserve was one of the first large scale mitigation projects there's four or five around it right now in the region. Uh, restoration is a big, big industry. Uh, the DWP project was a $65 million project over 20 years, 40 million for the purchase of the land. Now, when I say mitigation, this site was purchased and restored so Disney Corporation could develop lands in their, their property boundary, and it was really for the celebration development. Um, <clears throat> the remainder of the money is often for operating capital, contracting, big one, annual management funds, staff, and endowments for long-term management. So you got to think about when you do a restoration on a property, how is it going to be sustained and resilient through time? That takes management uh, money and staff. The most important component of the expense is staff. It's the second major cost, but it's the, probably the most important component. In order to do this kind of work, you have to have experienced, talented, and committed people through time. So, oops. Oops, wrong one. Um, Exotics, I call these dangling participles. You can't just consider what's inside your landscape. You have to consider both inside and outside influence. If you have exotics, they can be a real problem because when you're doing restoration with equipment, you are creating disturbed habitat and the most exotics love disturbed habitat. This was one of the two, two species that were the bane of Chris, who's gonna speak later, uh, torpedo grass and cogon grass. And then you also have critters like this that love to go rototill projects that you just spent $75 a square foot to restore. So you got to think about controlling uh, these things. And, and many of these things come from the outside of your project boundary. And it also can be with other ecosystems like shrub, native shrub uh, dominance changes that you have to manage through time. So thanks. Um, Again, this uh, project was to be at landscape scale. In the earlier picture, you saw all, a lot of other green lands. And it was 12,000 acres, which is a large project, but it, 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 it was a project within hundreds of thousands of acres of other protected lands of the Kissimmee Basin. So with that, I'll end. And I want to show you this. See these oak trees? The, they're a really good signature of a ditch. So that's what the ditches looked like at the landscape scale before they were restored. Now, all those scars you saw, if you look at them today, matter of fact, most of them six months after they, uh, the dirt work was completed, you pretty much could drive by and not tell it was a scar anymore from the native vegetation taking over. So I'm done. Um, let's move on and I'll stop share. Okay.
Thanks, Walt. I don't think we have any questions for that. So are we, I think Chris, you're, you're next, is that right? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I, I, I didn't get the message about being perfectly specific about DWP. So I've got a broader uh, restoration thing to go with. So yeah, I, no need, no need to be specific. Uh, I think we're, we're yeah, kind of taking everything more or less in. life, life learning and lessons. So I think that uh, we'll yeah, get that's there. The whole, that's, that's the whole theme of this. And, you know, Walt really, yeah. I think, drove that home, this idea that we could, we can restore stuff, but it's going to be messy. And this idea of perfection, you know, I, I know because I'm I'm almost as old as well, what, what people thought that was supposed to be. But in the end, it turned out to be beautiful and a fantastic success. So now go yeah. for it, Chris. OK, um, so here we go. Oops, don't know how that happened. Now let's figure out how to get back. There we go, okay, now we're back. Okay, well, um, so we're looking at my backyard when I was a teenager right here uh, in uh, Northern Illinois, uh, about an hour west of Chicago. And uh, I had this great fortune of having natural areas right behind my house and my mother and I decided in 1986 that we wanted to try to restore prairie. So we started burning our backyard. And it, of course, we had a lot of great lessons learned. Uh, you can see that not everything in the view is our backyard and it's all contiguous fuels. So that was kind of interesting for us to, to learn a lot about fire very early in our lives. Um, we, um, we did some seed work and we did some uh, acorn work and some other things. And we, we talked to all kinds of local experts on these things. Um, and I, I realized that anytime we go into a new project, we have an awful lot of new learning to do. Um, I, and, and so I understand that uh, Chestnut Foundation has been around for a while. I knew a guy in Wisconsin named Larry Severide, and he was involved with walnut conservation, and he was involved also with uh, assisting with chestnut work, and I actually used to drive by to go to my first wife's house, uh, a chestnut out planting in West Salem, Wisconsin on a bluff side. That was pretty cool, and it was a, a blight-free adult population, so I, I have that luxury of having seen a, adult chestnut trees. So um, I really am uh, glad that you guys uh, decided to uh, bring me out with this. Um, so I, I'm going to make some uh, comments here. When I was a kid, I, I, I drove by things and some things were boring and some things were exciting and I never knew really what was making what, what you know, beautiful along the road. But uh, later on, I realized that the native ecosystems were the exciting part and the post-human activity places were kind of boring to me. Um, Okay, so trying to coordinate two devices, I apologize. So I started restoration at 18 years old. I didn't even know what it was. Uh, I volunteered and I got entry level work and I did all kinds of that kind of stuff. Um, reading lots of studies gave me a good background on what I was trying to do. So. For those of you who are enthusiasts versus professors, um, work with each other because the people on the ground network with the people that are in the, uh, uh, the research facilities and, and they all have something to contribute to each other. Um, I mentor people now and, and that's one of the most fulfilling things I have is bring somebody who's new and enthusiastic into, into a, a field uh, that they're interested in and they, they get this obsession and they really want to contribute. And so here we have pictured some pineland restoration at a park called Lake Louisa State Park. And uh, what we're doing here is ground cover restoration. We've got rescue sites that are offsite and we are partnering with the developer that, you know, I mean, that's their job. They're gonna, 
they're going to do something to this land to create their their uh, monetary dreams. And uh, they've given us permission to dig native plants uh, and including listed plants, state and federal listed plants. And so we've brought them from a donor site and this is the recipient site. Um, down here, you can see irrigation lines and pin flags and the pin flags represent a planted plant and the irrigation lines represent the fact that we have a type six engine that we hook up to a hose array out here and then we irrigate these uh, plants. And so it's, it's a time, time, it's a very small scale operation in this regard. So thinking about the scale of what you're going to do uh, on your property or on the tracks that you manage uh, will give you the appropriate tools. And on this particular case, uh, hand planting things at a small scale uh, with a high labor intensity as Welp had mentioned can become a very useful thing. Now we also have a shade house and in that shade house, we grow out seedlings um, and we need volunteers to do these things. So that, that's where uh, some of this comes in. I'm just gonna go over a little bit of what, what, uh, what I'm going to review. So we just reviewed where I came from. So you kind of know me a little bit um, and the important, importance of relationships is another thing we'll talk about. How to think at the scale of the landscape. Uh, we'll do a little quick overview, overview of adaptive management. And then uh, we'll jump into technology, um, how to use it, how to, how to learn to love it. And then uh, thinking about the past and present, that's what brings us into the future. Um, doing things that have never been done before is what those who love to do something do. Everybody that loves these chestnuts is gonna find, they're gonna find out something new as they come along this path. And I think it's basically our job to convey that information. I had a, uh, a boss named Carlos De La Rosa at the Disney Wilderness Preserve, and he was a, a researcher and he had published year after year after year. And when he came to, the, to the, the project, he found that he didn't even have time to publish hardly at all when he was at the preserve. And he was very frustrated, but uh, because he transferred that knowledge that it's our duty to get that information to other people so we can keep conservation moving forward. Um, and then uh, setting goals and objectives that are just out of what you think are in reach is better than setting easy and safe goals that you know you're going to reach because you can already have those as secondary fallbacks. Um, and then we'll get sidetracked. I'm, I'm an easy digressor. So if anybody has questions, um, feel free to jump in and send them so that uh, our narrator can uh, get them to me. Okay, so as far as relationships go, uh, some of the things that happened in Florida uh, at the Disney Wilderness Preserve and then beyond, uh, where I, I formed relationships with a number of conservation people and this particular relationship really became handy and really blossomed Florida as well as this gentleman's business of helping people do conservation. Uh, and this is Chuck Grimes. He invented the Grasslander Cedar, uh, which is the device that was capable of putting wire grass in, this, in the soil without destroying it before it got there. Uh, I tried numerous other types of machines uh, and we had a fallback way of doing it too, but the labor intensity of the fallback method that we used was quite high. So we can get a single person in a five foot grasslander that you like you see over back here, this little yellow contraption. And we can tow that behind a tractor on a three point hitch and we can fill the bin with seed. And only a single person is necessary to operate this thing all day long. And two people would be a little better because it's nice to have someone in a truck driving around and pulling up next to you to fill the bin while the tractor operator is uh, just sitting there. So that way it, it reduces turnaround time. Um, in order to get the seed itself, the other piece of technology that's necessary is something to collect it with. And this silver box right here is a device called an Agrinua Flail Vac. There used to be another company in Canada, Canada called the Prairie Habitats, and they made another similar uh, device that was a bristle brush harvester. And these things are all modeled off of what's called the Old Dakota Seed Harvester uh, that was used in the Midwest to gather grain rye and things like that. Uh, in, in the Midwestern US uh, prior to some of these, these uh, 
um, prairie restoration and then uh, wiregrass restoration projects. But this, this Ag Renewal Flail Vac is the one that is left over. Prairie habitats is closed down. Uh, there was a research firm in Montana that also developed a machine and then they went bankrupt and closed down their business. Um, and so this is the only game in town at this point. And, uh, and so this pair of equipment go very well together for my personal uh, use in pine lands. And you'll probably find that you already have devices for picking up more chestnuts under chestnut trees once they start going. Uh, there was a, a walnut collector and an acorn collector back in the Midwest, I remember, that was kind of like uh, one of those little wheel cultivators that you'd use back in the 1970s and 80s to uh, grind ground minus the little tine harrows on the back. And it was made of rubber with little, um, little, little knobs on it. And I remember the forestry department showing us how to pick up uh, walnuts and hickories and, and, and acorns using this device. And they throw them into a hopper as it would go by. So there's all kinds of cool technology that can be used. Um, um, well, if you don't try something different, you'll never get to a point where you uh, change your opportunities. So uh, I formed a long-term relationship with Chuck. Chuck uh, retired recently and uh, has re relinquished his business to his daughter. And we're lucky that that's the case because someone could have bought it out and they could have shut it down and just stored it in a garage or something. So the future here for us is pretty good. And we're hoping that you guys can find something similar. Um, and then speaking of that, that helped us scale up things because prior to the Grasslander and flail vac and uh, hay, hay blowers, things like that, uh, it wasn't possible to do very big scale because people were growing plants of wire grass out by dividing plants in a greenhouse and then growing divisions in pots. And once we were able to harvest acreage of wire grass using a grasslander, a flail vac to harvest and the grasslander to put the seed in the ground, we were able to do dozens to hundreds of acres a year. And, and so uh, that scale has increased because of that. Um, other things that have happened in other conservation areas uh, in restoration, we've had some challenges in fire in some properties and in properties that I've been managing at the, the uh, Florida Park Service. Uh, we've you started to get more people with ex experience with aerial ignition uh, lighting fire from helicopters. And what's that, what that has done for us is it's increased the safe level of ignition on interior areas. Uh, it's increased the ability to get those interior areas lit in a way that doesn't cause the treetops to blow out or uh, people to be entrapped, animals to be entrapped. Uh, we can control how fire gets to where. We don't have as many miss spots and donut effects as we used to have. And, and so um, really, uh, those, those things are details, but that small stuff is important. And so uh, look at the other end of the rainbow. There's something to be said for uh, invention. So that big picture um, is also a big deal. Uh, Walt went over a lot of stuff about big picture planning and also the little details of planning. Uh, Disney Wilderness Preserve, as you noticed, is in a matrix within the watershed of several different other preserves. And those partnerships that we had and those, those groups that we formed uh, in those old days. I remember going to some of the older Lake Wales Ridge Ecosystem Working Group meetings. Uh, the Nature Conservancy started to bring people together from various agencies as well as the private lands, ranches, and uh, and then also uh, some of the county governments and things. And the information exchange there was just epic. There were people that, you know, they, they would just show up and they'd never even heard of ecosystem restoration. And two years later, they were implementing their own ecosystem restoration in both private and public places. And uh, that really leveraged the scale of what was going on. And that's one of the things that the Nature Conservancy was always really great at was at leveraging things by having networks, having meetings, having information and ideas flowing from one place to another. 
very similar to this, this little meeting we're having right now. And this is just a very microcosm of, of what that means. So when we look at and think about adaptive management, every adaptive management process from an inexperienced person's point of view starts with advice. We look at what research has done, what the landowners around the area have done historically. We get those things and we make these menus of actions. So when you look at this, uh, you're looking at the, the right half of this uh, slide where application and advice merge first. And basically this green and this red merge to create this brown strip in between. And that's going to grow over time as we grow more research and more, uh, more of that kind of stuff and more, more of that kind of um, applied um, information from, from the, the people that do the work in an institution. Uh, and then as we do action, we're gonna observe it. And as we observe it, if we're paying good attention, keeping good notes, then we come over here and we make decisions based on that new set of both research and observation. And then we refine that menu of actions into different choices and add choices uh, until we finally got this thing kind of out on an asymptote where we're close enough to where we need to be that we don't need to change much. And then it becomes more experience application, experience application, and that kind of thing. So, then how to think at that scale, uh, this is very redundant. We join groups of like-minded people with similar goals. We gather and give that information. We scale up the successes by a factor of 10. Uh, so that could be taking things from seed collecting in a bucket to seed collecting with the machine. That could be finding the network to have more labor to do buckets at a scale of 10. And so that little pilot project that you start with at that small factor and then scale up to the scale of the, the, the factor of 10 beyond that is what starts that process of creating a movement of restoration that can get people really excited about a potential success. Um, you know, if, if we've done 40 acres of chestnut restoration, uh, the next goal might be 400 acres of chestnut restoration. There's a guy uh, who worked his way up the park service chain of command. His name is Parks Small, which is interesting. He works for the parks and he's always thinking big and his name is Parks Small. And uh, I did a, a burn as a substitute burner at this park called Kissimmee Prairie State Park. And I think it was about a 2,500 acre fire, which is a huge fire. And when I got done with it, I posted on Facebook and he said, okay, your next goal is to, to break, to break 5,000 acres. You got to do it. And I said, oh, I've got to do it. Okay. I, I didn't even think about doing it. I thought, well, I was just in the substitute mode because someone had to go on vacation, but it was a perfect burn day. And so I, I led this fire and I had really great team man, members on the fire and it went, all went out real nice and, and it was all great. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, these little like, tiny acre, quarter acre fires are actually more difficult for me. We could probably make this work. So um, one day, uh, about two years later after that fire, uh, there was an opportunity and I was working with a person and she decided to do a 6,500 acre fire. And uh, we planned it out together and we all got together and we implemented it and it worked out great. So then the two of us were planning together to do this big over 10,000 acre fire. That's a really big, big fire. And unfortunately she passed away um, that irrelevant circumstances to the discussion. But uh, so in honor of, uh, of her, uh, myself and a couple other people planned it out and made it work. And we, we pulled off a really big fire um, that she had put all the pieces together so that it was possible to do. It wasn't, wasn't a thing where uh, we were seeing how big we could burn. We just had to get this habitat into shape for this endangered bird called the Florida grasshopper sparrow. Uh, and in order to do that, we needed to keep a tight interval on the fire return. 
So uh, it happened and it, it, was, it went off really well. And then the, then the current park manager uh, out there works with uh, his prescribed burn boss out there. And now they regularly are doing larger burns than 5,000 acres. And it's all because this team of people decided because of someone else saying, hey, you need to start thinking bigger than 5,000 acres that we're able to get this stuff done. So I really respect the leadership of uh, who I work with because they plant ideas in our heads of things that we should be trying to get done and scale things up. And it's really made a difference. And there's actually some hope for these little birds that there's a very small number of right now. Um, the best partnerships are mixed alphabet soup and mixed last names doing their challenges and successes together. So private and public is the best mix you can have because that perspective, that know-how from the landowner gets translated really well to that public agency manager. And that's one of the things that we've really learned is super strong. So in my business, I have to look for donor sites. So I'm always looking for a place to do quality work. And uh, let's see if I can't move this. I think this thing over here is in my picture way. There we go. Um, so over right over here, we have um, uh, a volunteer and they're harvesting seed. This site is not quite ready for a machine harvest because its grass density is too low. Uh, it's still recovering from restoration work that's been done. And it also has uh, newly planted pines in the uh, ground cover layer right there that we don't wanna drive all over. So um, always best to know what the tempo to do things at for yourself is and, and work your way that way through things. Um, and here's a point that I've seen along the way. In invasive species work and also in restoration work, there are a lot of illusions that happen. Um, there are people that spray chemicals on things and see something turn brown and they think they've controlled the population. And then they, they get complacent and then they come back. And in a year or two, they realize that the thing that turned brown was basically just shaking it off and re-sprouting and turning green later on. And while they are complacent, it got bigger. And so with invasive species management, we see the illusion of uh, somebody doing something and maybe they really weren't doing what they thought they were doing as I'm not eating a 20 foot tall cherry in Minneapolis right here. Sometimes it takes hand collection. And then we also have to look at the patterns of things that are out here. These are both grasses that are distinctly related to each other. And even though they have a very gross structure that doesn't look very similar, within the details of here are the same little parts of the flower on these grasses. Um, think about that when you're thinking about soils, thinking about failures and successes in your plantings as you move forward. I've been thinking a lot about chestnuts in the past few weeks, and uh, I don't know a darn thing about what chestnuts need to survive in the wild. And uh, so um, I just think just, Think about those patterns and isolate the patterns that are working from the ones that are not. There's a lot of stuff hidden out here. And the other thing about this is we don't really know what the endpoint is going to be. Because if you can't see an endpoint, you have to mark it on a goal and make that goal achievable, even if it isn't fully achievable, and make it get there. This is a reference uh, sandhill foothill that intergrades into a flatwoods at one of the parks that I manage. Uh, we didn't even know this existed until we burned it. And all of a sudden we had about a hundred species of sandhill species pop up right in front of our eyes um, in an area of about a half an acre right next to fully degraded land all around us. You just never know what kind of hidden gems are gonna be out there until you start getting the work done. Uh, recognizing reference sites is really important in my job. And so each one of these is its own different type of reference site. Uh, 
and they all have similar but different soils. They're all a little bit different topographically. Uh, and, the, and the views that I'm showing you are in different stages since fire too, with uh, this one up here with the blazing stars, the, the Leatris uh, and the wiregrass in flower, all um, from that same year's fire. Um, then we go into the first year following fire and the second year following fire. And then here's the third year following fire right before it's gonna get burned. So uh, different species are uh, evident in these areas in Florida. Uh, at each one of those years at the same month of the year. And that may be something that uh, is worthy of noting when chestnut restoration is done. I don't know anything about the flora understory or anything like that of chestnut uh, systems. So that's gonna be something to think about. And as Walt mentioned, mentioned things are pretty ugly sometimes in transition. Here are some ugly pictures. Um, of areas that, that look a lot better now. Uh, this is a small four acre wedge at a park that I did some re uh, restoration herbicide work on and then seeded it in right after this fire. And then here we did some scrub work where we did some chopping and some mowing work with a fecon mower in order to get it so we could actually get it ready for getting beautiful later on. Hey, hey, Chris, this is Sarah. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off, but um, we're, I, I want to make sure we have time for Chaz's presentation. And I, I would like to interject. Can you go back to that, that uh, picture? Um, Paul Anderson from New York mentioned that uh, there's a lot of state land in New York State. And um, he uh, wonders if it's being managed properly. And he, he uh, a lot of the responses that he gets from land managers with the state is that people don't like to see trees cut down. And I think this is something that that we talked about as a group while we were preparing for this, that, you know, this big, ugly wall, you mentioned it, you know, how do you deal? I, 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 I'm going to cut you off, Chris, after this one and then move on to jazz. so We have time and maybe we can get back to some of your other points. But I want to kind of address this question of how do you deal with that public perception of aesthetics um, when whatever treatment you're going to have to do. I mean, in many cases, I think with chestnut, we're going to have to work in clear cuts um, yes. or, or very he heavy shelter woods uh, because chestnut is a highly disturbance dependent species. So I don't know if you can speak to that. And then maybe we can move on to jazz and, and get back to any other um, points that you want to make uh, after, after Chaz is done. Sure. Okay. So first thing is be proactive. Don't, don't try to, to try to avoid having to be reactive to things. Um, off the left side of this picture, uh, this picture, right about here right now, there's a sign that says something on the order of restoration and progress, and please excuse our mess. And, uh, and so people understand that it isn't where it's trying to get to yet, but, uh, there, but there is a sign actually out there that people can look at and go, oh, okay, I get it. Um, and if they need to, they can ask us. And ahead of this, we had um, made sure that there were public announcements about the fact that things were gonna change in certain locations on the park and, and, and that we were gonna be working towards that, uh, those changes. It, these, some of these places aren't that pretty to begin with on the left side where we have rural grasslands with some pine plants, uh, pines planted in them. But uh, on the right-hand side where the, if you have like a primeval scrub, uh, we, we mentioned earlier uh, that we use logging uh, at times. Uh, we need to bring things back to a, 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 a non-dangerous condition at times. And talking to people about the, fire, the danger of fire uh, when we can't keep control of it is very uh, important to people and they understand that. Uh, and so you can see this is probably 60 feet. We put about a 60 foot mineral-ish break in here to reduce the, the, contiguity, the cont continuity of the fuels. And you can see there's a brush pile back here. And so there's gonna be a hot spot there. It might become invasive species, but uh, the rest of this behind here is reasonably close in its kind of ugly state to what it will be in the future. However, um, uh, once it's burned, it will come back fresh looking and people will be like, oh, that's very pretty. And it's probably match pretty good with the foreground once it's burned off too. So we are lucky that we have that opportunity. I can remember in the Midwest, we would pile 
uh, lots and lots of cut brush into piles and, and we would burn it while it was snowy. So, you know, most people didn't go out there in the middle of the snowstorm looking for brush piles or, or in nature as much. And it wasn't quite as ugly because there was snow on the ground. So that was very helpful. So using those seasons was very helpful in the Midwest. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you for those big uh, points. And uh, hopefully we have time to come back to a couple of other ones. Uh, Chaz, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to kind of bring it on home and then we'll, we'll see what other questions we have. And for those of you who haven't looked in the chat, um, uh, there's been some amazing back and forth. Zach, thank you for putting in some amazing points uh, there in the chat. So I recommend everyone go through and read through some of the points that are in there too, because it's there's some really good conversation going on over there. And if you have any questions, I'm going to remind you, throw that in the Q&A. Um, uh, I, I see, uh, Dan, you have your hand up, but I'm, I'm not going to have time to call on anyone today. So if you can just throw that, whatever question you have, maybe throw that in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, Chaz, take it away. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Can everybody see my screen? Am I showing the right screen? Looks great. All right. Great. Great. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chaz Oliver. I work for the Nature Conservancy here in North Florida. I'm the conservation manager. And, uh, Today we're going to be talking, uh, we'll stay on track with uh, restoration within the Longleaf Pine Hole system. I'm going to be focused here in North Florida and our sand hills. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's get, get to it. All right, that's not right. Here we go. All right, so just a little bit of background about the Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines Preserve. It was purchased by TNC in the early 80s. Um, if you look at the map on your lower left hand side, that is the Bluffs track. That was the original track. Uh, that was purchased in the early 80s. It was several iterations of land acquisition to, to make this tract whole. And uh, the reason why TNC even was interested in this piece of property was because of the unique geological formations. If you can see in that picture, it almost looks like veins running through this landscape. And those are steep head ravines. They, they range anywhere from 50 to 150 feet um, drop and the slopes anywhere between you know 75 to 30% slope down into these perennial streams. So just a really neat uh, feature. Uh, it's not found anywhere else in the country. I think Eglin Air Force Base has a, a little bit of steep head ravines. Uh, one of the state parks, Golden Head may, might be the name of it, has some, uh, some type of steep head ravine. And then the country of Georgia uh, has steep head ravines. And it's, it's really neat, unique, uh, really just unique uh, geological formation formed from sapping erosion. It's not like uh, over overland erosion or cut head cut head cutthroat erosion. Sapping erosion is just, is a where water percolates down through the soil and then hits an impenetrable layer of parent material and then begins to sap towards the lowest path of resistance, creating these steep head ravines. So the map on the top left, these are the different biodiversity hotspots within the continental U.S. Um, and right here on this preserve is one of the uh, seven biodiversity hotspots that they recognize here in the United States. Uh, so just really just flush with diversity, species richness, <clears throat> and just some, and really some neat endemic species as well, as well being found nowhere else. Uh, one of the endemic species here that TNC was really drawn to this property was the rare toria tree. It's the second rarest conifer in North America. I think the California nutmeg might be the rarest. So just some really neat stuff. And speaking of chestnut and the, just the whole reason why we're all here today, um, these species that exist in the steep head ravines are relics from the last ice age. So we have mountain laurel, we have sourwood, we have American beech, we have pyramid magnolia, ash magnolia, we have chinkapin. We have a, the whole fleet of hardwood species in these steep head ravines in North Florida, like you would see in cove systems in the Appalachians, like where chestnut was found predominantly. So just, just some neat stuff here. And so that was what, that's what drew TNC to this area. It's right there, borders the Apalachicola River. You can see it in this map to the west, which is the only river in Florida that has any sort of uh, contribute from snow melt. So that, that Appalach Appalachicola River is the Flint and Chattahoochee Rivers forming the Apalachicola just at the Georgia-Florida line. The Chattahoochee starts north of uh, Atlanta and north, northern Georgia and the Appalachians, and then the Flint River is just south of Atlanta. So we got a pretty unique watershed and just a really diverse area that we're working with. And that's what drew TNC 
uh, to this particular part of the world. All right, so now I'm gonna kind of take you back in time uh, from our early beginnings, early humble beginnings in ground cover restoration to our more uh, refined um, adaptive management techniques that we're using today. And I'm gonna definitely capitalize and, uh, and just build on what Walt and Chris have been uh, discussing so far. So this picture that you're looking at now is an aerial, aerial photo of 1940 of the Bluffs track. And what's unique about this uh, particular aerial photograph is you can kind of tell the reference conditions of the preserve um, before it was uh, altered. So you can see the shades of gray, that's your intact ground cover. You can see individual trees, the dots, um, uh, uh, indicating some a lot of longleaf pine, uh, probably several turkey oak, blue jack, and post oaks within the sandhill communities. And of course, you see the, those unique um, steep head ravine uh, formations. So in 1940, this uh, this, this piece of property was relatively intact. Of course, you see all the trails that are cut through, probably some old turpentining trails. Old, some of them are probably old cattle trails from running cattle on the property, and then just logging trails as well. So now we're going to fast forward 19 years. This is 1959. This is essentially the same aerial photograph, but 19 years later. And this is an aerial photograph. So a lot has changed uh, in just those 19 years. Um, it was owned by a different landowner. It's uh, the landowner now is um, a large paper company and their main interest is growing pines and lines as fast as they can for pulp production. Um, so what, so why I'm putting this here is I wanted to show the level of uh, disturbance that this piece of land underwent. The long straight lines, those are windrows. It's a forestry technique where you just rake everything up in the ground cover, tortoises, wire grass, Eastern indigos, and you put them in straight lines because you're pretty much avoiding all the area of any kind of competition, prepping that site for planting pines and lines. So what's also unique about this photograph, if you look in the far left-hand corner, something was different. Something you can still see a little bit of gray. You can actually still see some trees that were left over in that particular parcel that was not owned by the large paper company. That was owned by mom and pops. Uh, privately owned, and they just tried to replicate what the big timber company was doing. But they did it with a little bit lighter footprint, which lifts, which allowed some of the native ground cover to persist, which is great because let's fast forward to when TNC purchased the property. So we purchased the property. It's been converted to all-site pine plantation. It was converted so slash pine plantation on sand hill. And if anybody's ever seen slash pine trying to grow on a sand hill, it's pretty pathetic. Some of the trees, 70 year old trees, and they're up anywhere from six to 10 inches in diameter. That, you know, it's really nice tight rings on the tree, but they're just, all, it, all they're good for is pulp. And they're 70 years old. So we had loss of ground cover. Uh, fire was absent. You know, there was no burning being taking place post 1940. And the entire community shifts from a diverse, intact sandhill community within the longleaf pine system to a monoculture of slash pine or sand pine. And these two different pictures, the top picture is a slash pine plantation and the bottom picture is a sand pine plantation uh, within this area, either on the TNC's property or the adjacent state park. So TNC purchases the land. We're, we know the system's health is, you know, the one system is dependent on the health of the other. So the steep head ravines, which we were really focused on, you know, how, how do we manage those? You know, if the, if the uplands are in just terrible shape, the, then the health of the steep head ravines are, are, not, are gonna reflect that as well. So we had, so they put their heads together. How do we begin to restore this? And a lot of the early restoration involved, like Chris and Walt both said, some of it was removing timber off-site pine, removing the slash pine and starting to plant longleaf back, which in this case, the ground cover was absent. So TNC started to put a lot of thought in, how do we restore this ground cover? You know, will fire alone uh, restore this ground cover uh, without any sort of other adaptive management assistance? So TNC started, uh, from, the, from just the basic hand collection and then putting it through a leaf blower. And this picture is sometime in the, I think the late eighties or early nineties, which this particular area of the world here in North Florida is kind of where this whole ground cover restoration thought started to 
come about? How how do we restore how do we restore ground cover back to this system? If if it's a fire dominated system, and the one of the main things to carry fire is the ground cover, um, how do we get it back to this system? So it was a uh, it was a lot of research that was done. You know, we didn't even know up to the early 80s or late 80s how wiregrass even flowered. We didn't know that it that was dependent on growing season fire for a viable seed to even be produced. And that was in my lifetime. And uh, so that, that nut was cracked. Hey, we need to burn during the months of April, May, June, and July to really get the most viable seed from this uh, dominant bunch grass. So this, this is early restoration here at the Bluffs Track. This is all, you know, being monitored. They're collecting a lot of data to figure out what, what is the, how do we do this? So the early methods, they were successful. And, and, and like Chris and Walt both said, but how do you take that style of restoration and take it to any sort of meaningful scale? Yes, you can do it, but an acre or two acres at a time, are we really moving that needle far enough that it needs to be moved? So. Large scale restoration require, requires large scale equipment. You know, you cannot restore hundreds of acres at a time with a leaf blower and hand collecting wiregrass. So you got to take it to scale. So what's the next step? Let's let's take it to scale. So at the Bluffs track, you know, up until about 2008, they were mostly restoring those windrows. I showed you all those straight lines of just everything was uh, raked and piled in those straight lines. So TNC is like, hey, well, let's restore these windrows. The footprint was about 30 foot by whatever the length of it was. Some of them were close to a mile long. So what, what did they do? They went in with a bulldozer. They leveled the windrows. They piled all the uh, hardwoods that were growing in those windrows, burned them, and they created nice landing strips where, where they came in and planted warm season grasses. So here in this picture, at the um, the first part of the process uh, is you got to have a site to collect from. So we, we're collecting warm season grasses here in the Lonely Pine system. So you have to have fire to even create a donor site to collect grass from. So it starts with fire, it starts with fire in your donor site. So we're burning our donor sites and usually between May and July. Uh, and sometime through the summer, through early fall, we're taking the windrows out with a bulldozer, which you see in this picture down in the bottom. Starting in November, when the seed starts to set, we're out collecting. And in this picture, you see an ATV mounted flail vac, which is, it's a little bit more up to scale, but not quite to the scale that we're looking for. But for this particular project, it worked. And then there's a grasslander being pulled behind a tractor planting on these windrows. This was the, uh, this was restoration at the bluffs up to about 2008. And there was some more head scratching going on because the wire grass and other warm season grasses were not filling in these intra windrow gaps between, between the spaces of the windrows, just taking too long of the grass to migrate outside of that footprint. So let's take, let's take this process back, you know, back to scale or, or let's reevaluate this process. You know, that's adaptive management, right? We have to reevaluate how is this working? Can we do, can we make this more efficient and, and, and more to scale. So now we're talking about entire community restoration. So once TNC figured this out, they practically restored all the property on the Bluffs track, but just adjacent to us was Toria State Park, which had just acquired about 5,000 acres of Sand Hill um, communities with uh, steep head ravines just adjacent to the Bluffs track. So, hey, let's let's take this uh, work and let's take it on the road. So this is where partnerships, Chris mentioned partnerships, uh, partnerships, you know, within in our area and we have local implementation teams that are scattered throughout the Longleaf Pine Hole system. And in these local implementation teams, uh, we, sh we, we have MOUs and, and MOUs, there might be at least 10 different partners in these MOUs and, and where I work at, uh, our LIT is the Apalachicola Regional Stewardship Alliance. And on our MOU, we have U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Florida uh, DEP, Florida uh, FWC, uh, North Florida Water Management District, Tall Timbers, the Nature Conservancy. We have the whole fleet of state and federal partners. And what's great about this is when we're doing restoration, 
we can share equipment, we can share staff, we can, you know, we can share resources. And that's, that's very meaningful, especially when you're talking about doing four or 500 acres of ground cover restoration each year. It takes that sort of partnership and, and these uh, agreements to really push this forward. So this next step that TNC was doing, we're taking the show on the road. Um, we, we were like, all right, hey, we can take this to scale. So we have all this sand pine plantation. That's this picture you see. It's actually on Victoria State Park, off site uh, pine plantation. And we're going to convert it back to a fully functioning um, sand hill community within the Longleaf Pine system. So this is a process and it's a plan. It, there's a lot of planning, like Walt explained. You got to have, you got to be prepared and plan because your poor planning is not my emergency when you fail to do something and that yet you start screaming for my help to get something done. So when we have a sand pine plantation, the first plan is let's remove the timber. We remove the timber. It's usually uh, mostly fellow bunchers, some, some uh, mulching equipment, but it's mostly fellow bunchers just going in and cutting the pines and lines down, getting them off the property. Uh, the next part of this process is doing the site prep. There's a lot of logging debris left from a clear cut. So you got to rake, pile and burn. We want this site as clean as we as can be. So you, you end up with a nice parking lot left. So once you get the, once you get the site prepped and ready, you got, you had to have your uh, donor sites burned in the growing season. So now they're ready to collect that following fall. So here we are collecting wiregrass and this is actually a prairie harvester like Chris was talking about earlier. And then you have a big pile of wiregrass and other native seeds that you then start to clean and get ready to plant in your grasslander. And now, and this is the scale at which we're doing restoration right now. We're doing, and right now I have staff, staff collecting wiregrass seed and we've already collected over 6,000 pounds of seed so far this year to continue this restoration work on Torrey State Park. And the tractors you see in the lower right-hand corner I can't remember which RZ zone this is, but that's me taking the picture out of the cab of a tractor. And that's about a 350 acre restoration site on the state park. So this is the soup to nuts restoration like Walt uh, talked about earlier. We're, we're totally altering this um, a system from a monocultural pine plantation back to a thriving uh, sandhill community. And we're doing it all uh, within 36 months. After 36 months, we're putting fire back on this system. And after 36 months, it's able to carry fire because we've restored the, those ground, that ground cover component that in, and that functionality that that ground cover serves within the community. And after 36 months, we're burning it. And then another six months later, it's another donor site. It's a, it's, it's a donor site to, that exponentially adds to our donor sites of sites to collect and continue to restore. Um, ground cover throughout this uh, Lonely Pine system. So this, is, this has been great. I've, I've been very happy to be part of this work. Um, to, to date, I think I have personally restored over 4,000 acres of ground cover restoration um, in, in North Florida. And um, you know, it, this, is, this has just been fabulous work. I can't talk about it enough, sharing this with partners, trying to you know, demystify ground cover restoration in Lonely Pine System because a lot of people think it's just too much work and they can't do it, but it, it can be done. It's just proper planning and then execution and having dedicated staff like Chris and Walt had said. So just some indicators, if, if you can't just look at this picture and say, wow, that was a success. Um, other indications that the, this restoration has been successful, it's just the, the fauna that begin to migrate into these areas that did not exist before. We do bird count surveys in these sand pine plantations. You might hear a cardinal or a mockingbird, maybe a crow fly by, but after even just a year of restoration, we're already hearing Bachman sparrows whistling in this, these restored areas. We're hearing prairie warblers, quail. We're seeing just an overabundance of pollinator species and other insect life. Gopher tortoises start to migrate into these areas where they were absent before, or if they did, or if they were hanging on by a thread, now they're able to expand and maybe find a mate to continue recruiting into the recruitment of that population. Another success is the Eastern Indigo here at the Bluffs Track. We were a uh, designated site of, um, for Eastern Indigo 
reintroduction uh, in 2017. So just, and that's because of the restoration that has taken place on the preserve and also the restoration that we're doing on the state park as well is why this got the Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines Preserve was selected as a site to reintroduce Eastern Indigos. So now that I've gotten everybody up to the current, now I wanna talk a little bit about the future. So we've restored the Bluffs tracks. There's, there's maybe some minute restoration that needs to be done just to really, at least for, for me, you know, to bring it really up to, to speed, but that's, it's, it's minuscule compared to what we're doing elsewhere. So we're calling the Bluffs track for the most part restored with a little asterisk next to it. Uh, this map is showing that all the different colors represent polygons of um, previous restoration sites on uh, Toria State Park's Sweetwater track. And um, it's right now we're in RZ15 and you can see the dashed area. This is a 350 acre restoration site that we're getting ready to plant within the next couple of weeks, once we get done collecting grasses. And after that uh, restoration site's done, there's only two other restoration zones left on the Sweetwater track in Toria. And that's up in here and up in here. So this, this whole Sweetwater track, which is over 5,000 acres, is gonna be completely restored. And we've done it just over a decade, just about, which is, which is awesome. So you know, we're taking the show on the road to other places. We've already been talking with North Florida Water Management District, the new recently acquired um, Bluffs of St. Teresa tract here in North Florida, which has lots of sand hills that need to be restored, different levels of restoration, but still lots of, lots of ground cover restoration. Like Walt said, the Lonely Pine Hole system is from Southern Virginia <clears throat> all the way west to Texas, to eastern Texas, and then south of the Florida Peninsula. It's over 90 million acres. And of that 90 million acres, only 4 million of it's even considered longleaf pine habitat. And of that 4 million acres that they consider restored longleaf, it, a lot of times they're just going back and planting longleaf. They're not even considering the ground cover aspect of this restoration, which if you ask me, I would say the ground cover component is uh, more important structurally for the system than the tree itself. The tree, the longleaf pine is just, you know, that's just the iconic tree of the system. But the ground cover is where all your diversity, that's where, that's where everything's feeding, that's where everything's foraging, that's moving, that's helping move the fire uh, more so or, or, or equivocally to the longleaf pine needle cast itself. So restoration almost completed at the state park. And, and this next slide, this is just um, some of our different partner agencies that we've worked with where we restored uh, ground cover, um, and it, and the list just keeps growing every year, year after year, um, and this year is, is, is no different. I think right now on my books, I have over 500 acres of ground cover restoration that we'll be participating in this year between several state parks, TNC's property as well as, um, and we've actually, since last year, we started dabbling in doing some private landowner restoration partnering with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, so not only are we doing it on public land, we're doing it on private land as well, which Chris mentioned, you know, we got to involve the private landowners because they do make up a big bulk of the land itself as well, ownership of the land. All right, so as far as future restoration, this is a TNC Sweetwater track. And this is, uh, you can see the steep head ravines, uh, the pinkish colors, those are going to your lower lying areas in the the greens and yellows and oranges, those are the high, high ridges. And so this uh, parcel was acquired um, approximately 20, 15 to 20 years ago, TNC purchased this land. It has not been restored yet. It, it was, um, we've been focused more on restoring the state park, but now that the state park's wrapping up, we're starting to do more restoration on, on our sweet water track. It's a, we've approximately done after this year, this, this area right here, we'll, we're working on restoring it. I just had some site prep work done here to clean it up. So it's about 50 acres that we'll be restoring this year as well. Um, and then the remaining acreage uh, all down, all down in here and here is approximately about 230 acres. And we're hoping, hoping funding being available that we'll be able to restore that within the next five years. 
Um, Hurricane Michael really did a number on this area. Um, it's it's pretty much completely a complete loss as far as any sort of tree canopy goes. So um, it's and when you have that level of disturbance, it, it makes uh, operate operation costs uh, significantly higher. All right, and so just to, um, to wrap it up, I wanted to kind of go back and mention a little bit about partnerships too. Um, so the big circle you see right here in the middle, that is the ARSA LIT, the Appalachian Color Regional Stewardship Alliance. And, um, you know, it really is, these partnerships are, are, are worth their weight in gold. Um, I'm able to reach out to a lot of partners and go, hey, do you have a tractor available? Because I just have one tear up and it's going to be three weeks before I can get it out of the shop. And I only have two weeks to collect this wiregrass for it all falls off the stock. So being able to have those partners that you can rely on to call and ask for a piece of equipment or ask for an additional staff to help in time sensitive um, management, it, it, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, these partnerships, you know, we, we go out and assist all the agencies if they need assistance on prescribed fire or any sort of uh, management activity. If we have the capabilities, we go out and help whatever we can do. And so this is, you know, just being a part of these alliances and, and partnerships uh, can we can really make a huge impact conservation wise conservation impact. Um, and the last slide just uh, looking looking forward, uh, this is a recent area that we restored um, in 2019, this is two years since we restored uh, the ground cover and you can already see a lot of the bunch grasses really just flourishing. You see this one longleaf pine, it's a two-year-old pine. Um, it's doing really well uh, because it was planted in, in, a, in the logging deck there. So, uh, you know, longleaf, they grow fast. You know, you put them in the right dirt and, and they'll grow just as fast as a lob lolly or slash. But um, this is, this is uh, what, what we have to look forward to. And uh, the restoration in the, in the longleaf pine's whole system is uh, exponential at this point. We got, we got what? 74 million acres still that needs to be restored. So got to go big. And that's all I got. Thanks. That, that's incredible. I'm so glad you ended on that. The 74 million acres, um, sort of a, a general number that I use for American chestnut restoration is about 100 million acres um, <laughs> of, of, and I don't know that we're actually going to restore that ourselves. Um, but I think, you know, it's it's a real important take home lesson and, and a lot of the, the talk that's been in the chat, some of the take homes that I've I've gained from this conversation is how this work takes decades and the people who start it are not the people who continue it and and who eventually see the final stages of that work and um Another take home that I kind of want to um, make explicit for our audience is, is those cooperatives and collaborations, because most of the property in the eastern U.S. where American chestnut, um, in American chestnut range, there's, there's totally a lot of publicly owned lands, but a great majority of it is privately owned. And so forming those public-private partnerships and figuring out how we can get a great collaboration between the public partners and expanding that work into the private partners. Um, I, I know most of the people who are who are attendees and we have um, great representation from both. I see US Forest Service folks, I see DOF folks, DCNR folks, um, and, and then also a lot of private landowners too. And so just making sure that we can figure out how to get everybody collaborating. Um, Couple questions in here. Marion Keegan, uh, hi Marion. Uh, she asks, uh, what is the elevation dif difference in these steep head ravines? Can you speak to that? Sure, yeah, these the steep head ravines, they range, but most of it is, it's approximately probably 120 feet down to the perennial stream that's flowing. So where we're at is we have the mountains of Florida. You know, people, when they think of Florida, they think of a pretty relatively flat landscape. So these steep head ravines, um, the slope can vary. Some of them are, you know, gentle, gentler, like maybe 40% slope. And then some of them is a straight drop off. If you fail, you would break your neck or hurt yourself pretty bad. And it's, uh, yeah, they're really neat. They're um, slowly eroding uh, back to the east. And uh, I, I mentioned the sapping erosion. It's it's a not common form of erosion. You think of um you know, these, these sand hills got 150 feet of nothing but sand. There's no clay material in this particular sand hill. So water percolates down, it hits a parent material of limestone, and then it begins to move 
horizontal towards the river and as it moves horizontal it's slowly sapping away at that sand and it's pulling sand out towards the river. And then Steve Johnson Ball asks, generally speaking, what has been the impact of restoration on water quality in the respective drainage? Yeah, um, we haven't had any sort of a monitor set up, but um, it's, it's very minimal impact. Uh, uh, the footprint of the logging operation, we're not cutting into that. Um, we're even, it, we're avoiding cutting into which, which I would say is not exactly the ecotone of the steep head and the Sandhill community because I've I, that's not defined because of the previous management. There's you know, a lot, a lot of absent fire has allowed the actual footprint of the steep heads to get bigger with oak encroachment out into the uplands because of lack of fire to keep those nuisance hardwoods like laurel oaks and water oaks from, from walking up the hill. So um, it's, it's very minimal impact. Erosion is not a problem. A lot of these areas, the sand hill is pretty flat where there is some rolling uh, topography, we, we mitigate a lot of uh, overland flow through silt fencing, and, um, and actually that we will plant wiregrass plugs in these highly uh, prone, highly erosion prone areas just to mitigate for erosion purposes. But it's not, I, I would say, very minimal impact to water quality downstream. So I have a question about tree planting. So um, I, I heard a lot about um, preparation of the site and a lot about planting wire grass. How many longleaf pines are you planting or are you just letting them seed in on their own or, or how, what's the density, the planting density of, of longleaf pine trees? Sure, and I'll say that varies based off your objectives. Um, so we set a goal at about 400 trees per acre. Uh, sometimes we might do it a little bit higher depending on uh, what do we think the survivorship is after first fire? Because a lot of people that plant pines are waiting maybe till the pines get to a certain size before they even put fire back into that system. So uh, 400 trees per acre on average is what we typically do. Sometimes in our flatwood areas, we might go a little bit higher just to account for more pine mortality just because of competition in those sites. Um, but we're doing 400 trees per acre uh, in that traditional soup to nuts restoration, there are levels of restoration where it's like, hey, look, we got seed trees here. It might be 30 acres, but there's 10 seed trees scattered throughout this 30 acres. We might not plant any pines at all. We might maintain it as an open landscape because having that openness, it just allows for the potential to do more collection in there. Instead of going there and planting 400 trees per acre, it's a lot harder to get a flail back around a whole bunch of pines versus kind of leaving it open for a little while and then let it naturally seed in on its own over time. But Chris or Walt might have uh, something else to say on that. Yeah, I can talk about uh, some of the things that are going on in the Florida Park Service. We have uh, lots of different projects with different objectives and we have everything from probably about 50 trees per acre to about 600 trees per acre as, as the range of trees that have been planted per acre in longleaf uh, restorations that we've uh, been in, involved in in the past about seven years. Do you, do you find any difference in success on large scale versus small scale, or it, there's a lot of other variables that don't necessarily go just to number of trees planted? Um, uh, Scale-wise, um, you can plant bigger or better rooted trees in smaller scale plantings. We've found, you know, with these little, you know, 10 acre plantings we do, sometimes we'll buy 50 uh, citrus pot trees instead of buying, you know, uh, 500 or a thousand uh, uh, tublings or uh, something like that. Sometimes we use tublings and then uh, we are not doing very well with bare root trees. So we would buy bare roots to grow them out in a pot and then plant those in the ground. Walt, you have your hand up. You're muted. Walt, you're muted. We can't hear you. OK, uh, trees, about a 150 to 500, depending on the site. As you go south in the peninsula, you go down to the Kissimmee Prairie, where there might be a tree per, per 10 square miles. And that has to do with uh, basically the ecology of the system, way higher fire frequency. But the things I've learned about planting longleaf, containerized, important product you plant, and not postponing fire, 
that leads to heavier fuels on the ground often, which the uh, out of grass stage can't deal with. Um, and then a big factor is what is your uh, spring, summer uh, climate uh, or drought events? Drought events can be one of the biggest impacts. You can plant a bunch of great trees and you got a bunch of great dead trees because of a drought event. Can't predict that necessarily. Yeah, um, and, uh, and Sarah, okay, I want to type in on that too. Go ahead. Yeah, Sarah, and real quick, I'll be a heretic here and say that sometimes um, this, to wind us back to the idea of perfection, um, at, the, at the Disney Wilderness Preserve, all the great work that had been done for decades has, you know, gotten us to this place where it's just a beautiful longleaf habitat. And now the pines themselves are self-recruiting in different regions in the preserve. And some regions don't have a lot of uh, recruitment. Some have a lot. And so we've had foresters come on the site and ask us, what's our goal? You know, uh, trees per acre. So we don't have, there, are, there is no goal. Some uh, sites on the preserve are, you know, they have a lot of trees, some don't. And it's interesting, we're not, and so we get asked if we're going to force that. And I say we, old habits, all timbers, T and C, if they're gonna force that. But for the most part, no. So it's an interesting thing where to get to this stage now that took so much time, it's almost you've, you've worked hard and now you're letting it go, you know, as long as you keep the process of fire on site. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing. So in some places, I don't answer that question. <laughs> and that, that kind of goes to the question, John Hipple, and I'm going to end. This is the last question I'm going to ask. Um, uh, John says, I may have missed it since I was late, but once you established, then what? Is it going to remain long leaf or is there some succession that moves in or is this mainly now a management issue? Go ahead, Walt. I think the biggest failing of restoration projects is not considering long term. After you've reached the kind of footprint success, and often in, in Nature Conservancy's project, it was basic native ground cover vegetation and the ability of fire to spread. But I, in my young career, and Zach too, have re we restored sites, lonely sites, got them back to maintenance phase in terms of their fire regime and uh, hydrology. And the organization, did, not Nature Conservancy, the organization didn't make sure that follow-up good staff were there. And you can go back and they're just as messy as they were before the restoration was done. You've got to consider long-term care. And what's long-term? In my mind, it's kind of forever in a human interface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just one little tidbit. We've had winter planted trees and summer planted trees, but the peninsula of Florida has a summer rainy season and it really helps us with that. So we have two tree planting seasons. Nice. Well, this was fast, fascinating and fantastic. I really appreciate you all for sharing your expertise and your experience and, and thoughts. This is really helpful. There's way more here too. We barely even touched fire. And I actually got a lot of questions because I think you guys all submitted like really amazing fire pictures for your, <laughs> for, for the advertiser that we sent in. And we, we really didn't get to talk about that a lot. Um, but uh, one of the first questions I had was how much does fire impact um, chestnut? And, you know, I think that's going to be a, a whole other session when we can talk about fire and its implications, particularly in, in oak hardwood chestnut ecosystems, because that's, that's a whole other beast that we can wrestle with in, in perhaps another session. Um, for, uh, for those of you who are hanging on, thank you for uh, listening to this session. Next month in December, we're going to talk about Phytophthora root rot. And we have Katie McKeever, who works at the Resistance Screening Center with the U.S. Forest Service um, in, in Asheville, North Carolina, and um, Steve Jeffers, who is an expert on Phytophthoras from Clemson University. He's a pathologist who often joins us for these chestnut chats, um, and, and they will be presenting that information. Um, uh, thank you all. Lisa, if you have any final thoughts. No, just thank you to all these amazing um, practitioners, conservationists. They're my heroes, and uh, you do great, great work. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. This went long, but it was well worth it. I could listen to this all afternoon. So we'll do another one, right, Sarah? I think so. Yeah, okay. I think it's going to be warranted. All right. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, Sarah.